Good morning, church family. Good morning. It's good to see y'all on this chilly, chilly morning. We welcome you to Good Shepherd this morning. If you're visiting with us, we're so thrilled to have you. Please open your hymnals to number 204, and we'll be singing Emmanuel, Emmanuel. Oh, yes, please stand. <laughs> Emmanuel, Emmanuel, his name is called Emmanuel, God with us, revealed in us, his name. be seated. Good Shepherd, as we gather in this place to celebrate the second Sunday of Advent, gathered on peace, and as we gather together in this place, I'm Jeremy Squires. I'm the lead pastor here at Good Shepherd. We're glad that you're here this morning, and uh, welcome those in our online community who are watching us from uh, far away and nearby, and we welcome you this morning to worship as well. A few announcements in the back of our bulletin, some ways to connect this week. The Kids Angel Tree shopping is happening this afternoon, so they're going to go out and be able to buy for their Angel Tree people off the Angel Tree. And if you haven't done some Christmas card giving here at the church to give them some money to be able to do that, then I encourage you to bring your Christmas cards and put them in the boxes right around the corner as, and pay some postage for that. I also want to encourage you to pick up your own angel. The angel tree is right out front here on your right when you walk outside, and I encourage you to grab one of those angels. There are... Um, there have been some things in the angel tree this year, like a one person just wanted some pillows to sleep on. This is the kind of things that are on the angel tree. So I really encourage you, if you haven't gotten one angel, to go ahead and get one or get more if you want to and bring those gifts back by Wednesday so we can get those out to the families next Sunday. So please uh, do take partake of that and get the angel tree unloaded with angels. The church-wide Christmas music program is happening on Wednesday at 6.30. There's a free dinner before that at 5.15, but you've got to register for it the same way we always register. Dana, are you excited about it? You're very excited. Yay, yay. Every musical group in the church, choir, praise team, bells, children. We're going to have fireworks going off. It's going to be a no, no, no. David says no. I tried to say it past on this service. I, I said it last service. Imagine there are fireworks going off above your heads while this wonderful music is going on. And uh, it's going to be an amazing night. So please do come out and support all these groups working so hard uh, to get ready for this. And it's a lot of work to get ready for this. So please come out and support them at 630 on Wednesday. Then also next Sunday we'll be delivering fruit baskets to our GSUMC community. So we encourage you to, to come out and help us to give baskets out to those uh, around us. And also that night is our blue Christmas service of the longest night, <coughs> Woo. a service of healing and hope. And a time sometimes during Christmas is not a time people are, are joyful, having a hard time celebrating. They've lost loved ones. They're having a hard time for whatever reason. And it's a chance to be able to be, able to be present with other people who are going through the same thing and to find hope and to find healing through scripture and through song. And so it's okay not to be celebrating all the time when you find yourself in that place. Maybe it's not you, but maybe it's somebody you know. If it's somebody you know, I invite you to have them come and be a part of this as well. It's a very uh, hopeful and healing service when we gather together and do it. Six, th six o'clock next Sunday night. Those are the things that are in the midst of the bulletin here. And then in your connection, there's lots of other pieces as well. And also invite you to make sure to get a rever reverse Advent bag. Remember to get your canned foods every day. And to gather those up and to bring them back on Christmas Eve or sometime after it with a full bag of canned goods and then uh, or non-perishable items. 
And then the other insert is all of the Advent stuff that's going on and our whole calendar all the way through. I do invite you to write down this, uh, January 3rd. January 3rd is the date for our open house this year at the Squires family for the Epiphany Open House. I invite you to come out and be a part of some great food and some great uh, fellowship with each other. And on the back side of it, we're coming close to the time of which we give poinsettias in honor or memory of someone. And if you're wanting to do that, you need to fill one of these out and then be able to turn it in uh, as well. Trees are being purchased. Reeds are being purchased. Contact the office. You can get a great deal on those things as well. And then Christmas Day dinner is coming up as well. These are all things that are happening during the course of the season. And I encourage you to take down these dates and write them down and, and be able to put those into your calendar in some way whatsoever. But now let's prepare our hearts to receive Christ's All right, thanks, Brent. There's more information in your bulletin about that and also in your connection, so you can contact Brent or Kathy about that as well. So as we gather in this place, prepare our hearts for worship this morning. Let's soak in the music. Uh, this morning, it's the bell bringing us uh, one of the pieces they're doing Wednesday night, I believe, too. So uh, we look forward to soaking in God's spirit through them.
was amazing. More of that Wednesday night. Come on out. Lots of great music's going to be happening that night to celebrate our Savior. Let's stand for the call to worship this morning. As we gather together, you'll find it on your screens. The prophet Isaiah declared that justice and peace shall come through the family of Jesse. Peace shall be established in all the world. Blessed be God who does such wondrous things. Before you greet one another, let our acolytes come down and be able to light the candles. And since they're ready to go, they were so mesmerized by the bells that none of us did what we're supposed to. So come on down. And as they're doing that, they'll get in the way of their fire. But greet someone, make somebody feel welcome this morning. No shaking or faking. Make somebody glad to be here this morning. Don't forget to do the regular song because they won't. Let's continue in our worship together this morning. Uh, we'll sing Hark the Herald Angels Sing. It's number 240 in your hymnals. We'll sing all three verses. Joyful longing nations rise, join the tribe. 
I invite those who are lighting the Advent candle from the Tuesday morning Bible study group to come up. You good? Okay. Be glad to. the lighter. You know how to use it? Okay. You got to start talking. The prophet Isaiah wrote, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. And John, the messenger of God, proclaimed to all the people who came to him in the wilderness that they must repent of their sins and be baptized. Many people heard his message, repented, and were baptized in the River Jordan. It has become our custom to prepare for the birth of the Messiah by decorating our cities and homes, hanging lights inside and out, and singing Frosty the Snowman and Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, and measuring the quality of our Christmas morning by the number of gifts we receive. As we light the second candle in preparation for the coming of the Messiah, perhaps we need to listen again to John the Baptizer's message, preparing the way of the Lord. Make straight the paths, repent of your sins, be baptized, and live holy lives devoted to God. Come, Come Lord, Lord Jesus. Jesus. Amen. Amen. to respond to the lighting of our Advent candle today by pulling out this insert from either your hymnal or your bulletin. We'll sing verse 2 of Light the Advent Candle. Light the Advent candle to think of home shepherds who filled with wonder at the sight of the child of Christmas night. Candle, candle burning bright, shining in the cold winter night. Candle, candle
Thank you, choir. As we gather together in this place, and we may have a few celebrations, and during the Advent season, it's hard to fit all the things into, but I do hear there's some birthdays over the last two weeks, so anybody having a birthday over the last two weeks? Want to share? What? That's right. And there was a rosebud in the pictures last year on the altar, right? At the exact same time. So happy birthday to Alexander. Yes. Yesterday. 85. All right. Miss Peggy. Yeah, you're right. 85 on the 14th. Congratulations. What? Oh, Big Jeremy's birthday? Okay, yeah. There's a lot of Jeremy's in the room together right now, so it's just confusing. So, yeah, awesome, very good. Happy birthday to him, too. What, 37? All right, very good. Other birthdays? Anniversaries? Anybody celebrate anniversary over the last two weeks? Brent. 32 years, all right. Brent and Kathy. Awesome, very good. What, you got an anniversary, too? Do you guys get married now, too? How many years for that? <laughs> Eight. All right. Congratulations on that. Very good. Awesome. Very good. Those are great celebrations, and those are some of the things we bring as our offerings to God is to be, be able to celebrate. We also bring our prayers, our presence, our financial gifts, our service, and our witness. We bring our prayers through prayer request cards you can find in the pews you can fill out. A chance for us to, to be able to pray for those in our connection every week. So make sure to take the connection home. Pray for those folks over the week and, and they can be able to feel those prayers. Add somebody to the prayer list. Send us a praise. The uh, Baker girls uh, send us prayer requests every week. They're very faithful about letting us know what's going on. They celebrated this morning that Avery, the small child they've been praying for, was able to start walking. And that's a big deal because Avery wasn't going to make it at one point down back before. The prayers are, prayers are encouraged. Prayers are part of who we are. And our presence, chance to come here to worship God together in this space, in this place, during this season especially, is important. It's important to gather together as community and be present. And so when you came in, there was a pat on your a pew that is a chance for you to be able to record your presence here and to fill it out and to be able to, you can register for Wednesday night as well. If you're coming Wednesday night for our free meal, just let us know you're coming either online or through the pad. And uh, fill it out, pass it down your row. If you're a guest with us here today, we're so glad you worshiped with us this morning. And we're glad that you found a place, hopefully, to belong. Just a place to believe and to become all that God created you to be. So fill this out and pass it down and make sure everybody else has a chance to be able to gather together. And make sure no one ever leaves this place feeling like they haven't been welcomed uh, as we gather together. And if you know somebody who usually sits next to you that's not here, reach out to them. Find out what's going on with them and just, you know, hey, I missed you. People like to be missed. That's an important part of life. If we don't feel like we're important to somebody else, then you know, it's real hard for us because we like to feel important that somebody actually missed us not being there. And so reach out to people around you when those things uh, happen as well. And then a chance for financial gifts to do ministry in this community and around the world. I've, I've challenged you during this season every year to, to find some way, take 10% of what you spend on yourself and your family to spend on others outside of that. Find some way to take opportunity to be able to find ways to be able to do that. Instead of just, it's not about us. It's Jesus' birthday. Why don't we get all the gifts? He, what, we should be giving him gifts. Things that he can be able to use with other people who are around us. And so it's important to focus on that. So don't lose sight of this true meaning of this season. And to serve, to find, find the ways to serve in, in, in your ability to do that. To, to be able to find ways to take an angel off the angel tree or to toys for tots or room at the inn or helping the homeless, or the salvation kettle when, it, when it's ringing. You know, don't walk by it. Put something in it. Don't pretend like you don't hear or don't know what's going on. Find some way to give of the resources that you have to serve with your hands or whatever else it might be. Find some way to touch somebody's life. And then witness, to be involved in witnessing, to sharing that. I was in the line at Taco Bell the other day, and something I don't do a lot, but, you know, you always hear about it. I you know, said, I'm going to pay for the person behind me. You know, that just came right off the top of my mind. I'm like, okay, I need to do this. So, so I did that, and it's so funny because mine was like five ninety nine, and then she says, "Well, theirs is fifteen ninety six. Do you still want to pay for it?" <laughs> I was like, 
No, 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 that's too much money. That's three times my amount. I'm not going to do it. Of course I'm going to do it. And so, you know, it's just, you know, things like that. Or just making sure that everyone you come across knows that you serve Christ. That you bring joy to their life and light during this season. So everyone you meet, all the, shop, all the clerks, they're in the shops. And everywhere you go, someone's day is made because of you. Take your love cards around. Make sure you don't forget them when you go to restaurants and go to shops and, and when you go and do all these things. Make sure your presence is known by giving the present of Christ to others. Prayers, presence, financial gift, service, and witness. These are all the things we give to God this morning. Let our ushers come forward to receive. Gracious God, the Jesus, the name above all names. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the wonderful counselor, mighty God, Prince of peace. And as we come this morning, we come here to be able to say thanks, to connect in this place of worship and to know you in our lives and to thank you for the great gift that we're about to receive once again that's wrapped up in this season. We've come here to grow, to become more like you. We've come here to serve, to serve others, to live out your mission that you started and gave to us. We've come here to go, to spread the good news, to rejoice, joy to the world. Jesus is born. A Savior has come for all of us to bring us hope and peace and joy and love. So through our prayers, our presence, our financial gifts, our service, and our witness, we bring all these things this morning as presents to you, Almighty God, Child King. May these things be used for your ministry and your mission in this world. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, and the people of God said together, Amen. You may be seated. P and O, you got those pictures close. I forgot to mention during our offering that we also had 71 uh, kids here on Friday night for our parents' night out, which gives parents a chance to be able to to go out and to uh, or take time just by themselves to kind of get themselves situated. We had our special guests, of course, and we're thankful for our special guests and thankful for. Brittany and Stephanie and Cassie and all the teams, people who were volunteers to help out, including the youth and uh, how they helped. And so that was an amazing time and, and crazy and everything. And they brought canned goods as their gift to St. Nicholas, as we told the St. Nicholas story. And so it was a neat time to be able to serve in our community. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious God, may the words that I say be acceptable and pleasing to you. May they speak to our hearts about your name. 
how important that name is. Why is that name important? What's the wonder of that name and how can it change our lives? So Lord, just pour into our time together with the power of your Holy Spirit and a light upon the words you've given me. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. And the people of God said together, Amen. So during this time of the year, the world is reminded of the true meaning of Christmas. You know, it actually means Christ's Mass. Mass is worship in the Catholic tradition. And so every time someone says Christmas, they're really saying a religious word. So tell your non-religious friends, they're saying something religious, they might freak out. It's Christ's Mass. That's what it means. On Friday night, I already mentioned, we, we talked about those things, and, and we talked about St. Nicholas. That's my job. My job is to bring into the tradition the whole understanding of who St. Nicholas is and how he started and who he served, because we lose sight of that. St. Nicholas becomes Santa Claus, he becomes Santa Claus, and then all the meaning is lost behind who he was as the gift giver to children serving Jesus, the patron saint of sailors and prisoners. We lose sight of this incredible man and this incredible name of St. Nicholas. That 2,000 years ago, a baby boy was born to a Jewish couple in the town of Bethlehem. And that we would still celebrate that today is pretty amazing. It's something celebrated around the world. Differently, of course. Every country has their own traditions and they're amazing to kind of read about them and to watch them as each tradition is very different but they're all centered as Christians around the Bible. I was watching the lighting of the tree in Rockefeller Center, and it's just so funny to see all the secular singers sing Joy to the World in songs that have such Christian depth and meaning that you would never, ever hear any other time of the year, and there'd be no protest about it. But at Christmas, it's all okay. It transcends the ability of that. I've never heard so much Jesus in my life on TV. And often we think we know what the Bible says about this age-old story. We know these stories backwards and forwards, and and so we don't look at them anymore. We don't really read them. But do we really know them? This is a little short quiz, and i got a lot more questions I could throw at you. But three questions are, what animal did Mary ride on? I don't want you to answer it. How bright was the star? And how many wise men were there? Go back and read the scripture, not what you think, what you've heard, what you've grown up. Go back and read the actual scripture, and I think you may find the answers are quite different. You see, one of the surprising things we learn about when we actually look at the scripture and the story is the Bible and about his birth is not in two of the four gospels. Only two of the four gospels even talk about his birth. The other two don't say anything at all about it. Mark and John say nothing about the birth of Jesus. Mark opens his gospel not in a manger in Bethlehem, but a river in Galilee. Jesus is not surrounded by shepherds, but he's being baptized in the river. Mark skips all the nativity stuff. He gets right to the mission. That's how Mark is. Just the facts, ma'am. He's straightforward with an emphasis on what Jesus did rather than on his birth, or even his words, or his teachings. In Mark, you won't find as many words of Jesus, or teachings, as the other Gospels. More about what he did. And John also leaves out the Christmas story, beginning his account with some deep words of theology. John goes back not to a starry night with the Magi following a star to the King of Kings. He goes all the way back to the beginning. And the word was God. And so it is that we have Matthew and Luke alone to thank for the time-worn stories of the traditions of shepherds and angels and a holy family and Bethlehem and wise men all surrounding the birth of a helpless child whose name happens to be Jesus. Another interesting part is how the details are so different in each story. I'm telling you, go back and read the first two chapters of Luke and of Matthew, and you will find things you have not seen. We want to merge them together in reality. The, main, the scene that we have at our nativity is a combination of both. Not the same story. Not in the same way, at least. They're very different. 
For instance, Luke tells the story from Mary's point of view. Have you ever noticed that? Whereas Matthew tells the story from Joseph's point of view. Luke, the only Gentile gospel writer, non-Jewish, carefully traces the lineage of Jesus back to Adam, the father of all humanity. It's in Luke's gospel we read about Elizabeth, John's mother. Luke tells his story from Mary's point of view because he wants his readers to know that Jesus is for everyone. And so he emphasizes his humble birth in a manger. He tells the story of the stinky shepherds who come to bow down. Matthew, on the other hand, was a Jew. Maybe the disciple who was a tax collector. He also provides a list of Jesus' ancestors, but he only goes back to Abraham, the father of the Jews. Matthew shows that Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah. He shows you all the evidence, the Old Testament prophecies that back it up and prove it. Now, I've mentioned before that Jewish culture at that time was very male-oriented. They would even pray every day in their morning prayers this prayer. They would say, I thank God that God did not make me a Gentile, a slave, or a woman. Every day. Knowing that helps us to understand why Matthew tells the story from Joseph's point of view, being a Jewish man. He has Christ as the king of Israel. He's the one that describes other kings coming to see this child, you see. And he tells us about King Herod and his fear of no longer being a king. They are different perspectives, but there is one thing they both converge on. One detail they both include, the name of the child. See, the name of a child can be a very important thing. You know, when I was growing up, then my name, Jeremy, my mom always said that my name comes no particular reason, though I think Chad and Jeremy were very popular right around 1970. But she says that I just popped out, and it was a Jeremy, is what she said. However, my name was a good name to make fun of, too, when you're growing up. So I was at uh, Einstein Bagels and, and Franklin a couple weeks ago, and, and uh, the person who was typing in my name, she typed it in right, but the f- computer didn't keep up with it. So she, and she said, well, it's going to come out wrong. This is what it came out to say, Jeremy. That is what I was called when I was a kid, too, amongst many other kind of names you can make up out of Jeremy as well. And so that was a, a constant thing. I remember when I, was, uh, when I was in college, my Wesley Foundation friends at MTSU, we were out at Shoney's, and back then there weren't cell phones, so when someone wanted to call you, they called the place where you were at to get a hold of you. They knew where, you're, where you were. So this person comes out from Shoney's and says, Is there a German squares out there? German squares? Is there a German squares? I'm like, that's not even close. What is wrong with you? I was called squirrels because of my last name. I'm called, you know, Jeremy lots of times. I mean, so names, you know, there's a lot of things that happen like that. And maybe your story is not as entertaining as my story. Maybe it's even better than my story. But we usually all have some kind of stories associated with our names. Jesus is no different. Though his story is a little more unusual than mine or yours, perhaps. So the question we have today is, what can we learn about this name of Jesus that can help to awaken in us the wonder of Christmas? And I want to give you three things you can write down and things you can think about. First, the wonder of Christmas is found in that it is a special name. This is a special name. Luke tells of Gabriel's announcement to Mary while Matthew tells of the angel's announcement to Joseph, for bonus points, what's the name of the angel who announces to Joseph? Look it up. A different announcement, but in both cases, the angel instructs them to name the child Jesus. The first part of our key verse for today, Matthew 1.21, says, You shall call his name Jesus. And in case you didn't get it the first time, in Luke 1.31, Gabriel says, You shall name him Jesus. 
Gabriel's message to Mary seems to reflect God's promise to David that's recorded in 2 Samuel 7, 12 through 14. A defining text of the Old Testament you're probably not familiar with. But listen to these words and think about how this would sound to Mary as she received this announcement. And to Joseph. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring that succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. Now, what house is Joseph from? David. See, God's fulfilling the promise made to David by sending Jesus to establish the kingdom of God through the house of David, which is why it's so important that Joseph is from the house of David. And Luke uses similar language in the Annunciation. Mary would have been familiar with this promise God made to David. And so Luke uses this because his readers would also know something about this. And the coming of David's offspring means restoration, the end of oppression, rest from evil. And it's obvious this detail is very important if God's messenger tells both parents. And important enough for Matthew and Luke to both write it down. But why is it so important? Why is Jesus' name such a special name? Like the song goes, Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name. Well, what is it? What's special about that name? When we first enter the world, the first thing we are given, except a rude awakening, is a name. We are given a name. Most of the time, our parents have thought about it long and hard for months, probably wrestling with it, fighting about it even. And there's often a special association with our name. Sometimes it is a family name, maybe even one we try to bury in the middle. I was talking to folks after first service, and they were telling me their middle names and their first names and how they go by their middle name instead because their first name is like Freddie or something like that or you know something really different they didn't really want. But it was a family name, so they got it no matter what. Our daughter Hannah, um, her name means grace. And so the reason that she's named Hannah is that Mandy and I, uh, Hannah's mother, were trying for seven years to be able to have a child. And after two miscarriages, we'd given up pretty much after seven years. And we were starting to try to figure out what was going to happen next and what we were going to do. And it was about this time of the year where Mandy was writing a devotional for uh, the church we were at at Brentwood at that time. And she wrote the devotional about Hannah and Samuel. And so it was also during that time that we found out that she was pregnant. And so obviously when the time came, it made the most sense that, some, that, that Hannah's name would be Hannah. I might be biased a little bit, but if you know Hannah at least at all, I, I think she lives into the name of Grace as well whenever you see her and who she is. So names can be very important. Um, they're amazing opportunities that we have. And the angels prevented some of the couple struggles we go through because the angels just told them both the name of Jesus. Wouldn't you like maybe for somebody to come down and just tell you to name your kids and get over that fight and just say, okay, your kid's going to be named this, your kid's going to be named this? But there was a time, you know, back when you couldn't even know a baby's gender before ultrasounds even. You know, some of you remember those days of, of not being able to know that. Or by choice. I did not know that Hannah was a Hannah until she was born. I didn't want to know. Mandy ended up finding out halfway through, but to her credit, she didn't tell me. Because there are so many ways in life that surprise is taken out of everything that we do. There are very few surprises anymore for anything. I wanted to be surprised. And I was surprised, all right, because it was a C-section. I was in the operating room, so I got to see everything. So I got plenty of surprise as Hannah came out, and she was a Hannah. You know, the room was decorated green and yellow. We had little dinosaurs all over the walls and that sort of thing. We all survived not knowing what it was going to be. 
And used to be baby showers happened after baby was born because that's when you figured out what you're going to be able to have, a pink or blue or whatever color in the world. But that's how it worked. Today, you know, naming children is something that many seek to be highly unique. We want our child to be unique. The name has to be unique. It has to be different. Almost a fashion statement. With an internet list of names, either you want one of those names or you don't want one of those names because they're the most popular. Because many parents use a name to set their children apart. Well, that can backfire on you too. You get too crazy about your name and you end up getting made fun of as you're a kid a lot, the weirder your name might be. But back in Jesus' day, names held great meaning. That's why in the Bible we read that when something significant happened to someone, they changed their name. The name was changed. You see, when God gave someone a new name, it was because a divine purpose was revealed in their life. And they needed a new name to be able to live into that purpose. For instance, God changed Abram's name to Abraham when he became the father of many nations, Genesis 17, 5. Jesus changed Simon's name to Peter, the rock, in Matthew 16. So why Jesus? Why that name? Well, there's a lot of meaning in that name, actually, that you may not know about. You see, Jesus is the Greek form of the Hebrew name Joshua. And every Jew knew that name because it was the name of Moses' successor, Joshua. Joshua was born a slave in Egypt, was named Hoshiah, which means salvation. And being a slave, though, his name was only a hope, not a reality. But when Moses led them out of slavery across the Red Sea, hold on to this history lesson, he chose 12 men, one from each tribe of Israel, to go into the promised land to scout and spy and come back and report. But here's the important thing we find in Numbers 13, 16 that you probably don't know. That before he sent the spies out to explore the land, he changed Hosea's name. He took two words, Jehovah, Yahweh, and Hosea, meaning salvation, and wove them together to form a new name. Joshua which means the Lord is salvation or God saves. And when Moses died, Joshua became the one who would lead them into the promised land. So when the angel announced to Joseph the whole verse of Matthew 121, you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. He was telling them that this is the one who would bring salvation to God's people again and lead them to a new promised land, the kingdom of God, unlike any humans could do. That he would be the Lord of salvation in the flesh. They understood that, both Joseph and Mary. Second thing is, the wonder of Christmas is found in a name that saves. Jesus is a name that saves. You ever wondered why God sent his only son in the mean and hostile world of an Israel that was conquered by Rome? Why then, of all times in history, why send your son into that? There had to be a problem so big that it needed to happen then and it couldn't wait any longer. And the significance of Jesus' name is that he saves us, so he must, we must need saving. So what is our big problem that we need saving from? Well, it could have been ignorance of God because the people didn't understand who God was or what God expected, but then Jesus would have only been a teacher, which some folks believe that he only was. Maybe it was our brokenness. God knows we're all broken, that we're all hurting inside, but then Jesus would have been only a healer. Our, or our problem could have certainly be relational. Our inability to get along with one another, even people we love. There is no peace in this world. There is still fighting in Bethlehem, even more so over the last several weeks. There are wars all around the world. We can't get along as individuals or as countries. But if relationships were the only reason, Jesus would only have been a counselor. 
Perhaps the problem was poverty. But then Jesus would have only been a prophet crying about economic injustice or a financial advisor to help us. See, our problem runs deeper than all those things. We need a holistic Savior who saves us from ourselves. We need to be saved from our rejection of God because we seek our own kingdoms and not His kingdom first. But the angel says, for He will save His people from their sins. The reality is that we all push God out of our life at some point. At some point, we reject the relationship God wants to have with us. We seek our own kingdom first instead of God's kingdom. And the Bible calls our rejection of God sin, which is that three-letter word we don't like to talk about much. But it's actually an archery term. It means to miss the mark, to not hit the bullseye. That's what it meant. And that's why Jesus came. Because God knows that all of us need a Savior. Amen? You see, Romans 3.23 says, All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All. There are no exceptions to that. And we need someone to lead us from slavery to the land of the living. The promised land. You get it? Jesus and Joshua. And who are his people he talks about? Or his people are those who believe in him and who crown him Lord of lords and Lord of their lives. It extends over the boundary line of Judaism. It includes magi who came from afar as well as the shepherds who were tending their sheep on the Bethlehem plain. That's a wide swath of people. It includes you and me as well if we let it. The third wonder of Christmas is found in that it is a new name. God has given you and me a new name. The highest name we can have. A name not chosen by our parents, but by our heavenly parent. And once you accept Jesus' love and say yes to the one who came to save us, to save you from your sins, then you receive a new name. And that new name is the name of Christian. That name means Christ follower. One young man already has that name. It means Christ follower. And once we take on that name, we begin acting like Christ. Because we can't be a Christian if we're not going to act like Jesus. You see, it means we have accepted the gift of salvation that we're talking about once again during this season that we're in. It costs God an only son who after being born in glory in the highest would give his life in the same glory on the cross during Holy Week. And I've said this before, because it isn't the birth of a Savior who makes us who we are. It's the death and resurrection of one that makes us who we are. Amen? The birth is just easy. It's easy for anybody in the world to like a baby being born and to surround ourselves with all these characters of the manger and sing all the songs and everything. But listen to those second and third verses of all the songs you sing. They are not the ones everybody knows. They are the ones that truly talk about Jesus and his whole life and his whole mission. And who does Jesus save? All people who believe. It extends beyond racial and cultural and gender and socioeconomic boundaries. It extends to you and to me and to everyone. No one is left out in that. Jesus has come to save us all. There's so often this this idea that there's, there's, there's this taking Christ out of Christmas. There's this war on Christmas. There is not a war on Christmas. When I go places, I say Merry Christmas. And what they say back is up to them, not me. I don't care what they say. I'm not doing it for them. I'm doing it for me. It's how I celebrate. It's how I share. I don't need you to do that. You do what you got to do to be able to respond how you want to respond. I see that most folks tend to respond with a nice way when they're not being somehow backed into a corner to say something magical that's going to somehow spark something. How do you keep Christ in Christmas? The way we do that is, is by focusing on what he brought to us, what he gave to us. Because you can't take Christ out of Christmas, no matter what you do. Christmas 
is the tradition of the Christian church. No ifs, ands, and buts about it. From the very beginning, you can take everything out you want to, but you can't take Christ out of it because every song reeks of it. Everything that we do reeks of it. Even Christmas trees reek of it. Everything that we have, the red and green, when you put red and green up, the red is the blood of Christ and the green is the everlasting life as the way it has been for centuries and millennia. That's what it really means. Every poinsettia speaks to the flower of the holy night. Everything that we do is wrapped up in it. You can't escape it. They may think that you can, but you can't. And when we gather together, we, we gather the majesty of a name that was registered in heaven. It was delivered by an angel that was given to a newborn child who was honored by the lowly shepherds and then worshipped by rich and wise foreign advisors who came from the east over thousands of miles. All to see God's own son, our Savior. So will you come and experience the richness of the one named the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? The one named Mighty God, Wonderful Counselor, Prince of Peace. Will you take time to kneel before Him in His manger as your Lord this Christmas? And not only during Christmas, but also every day afterwards. Will you kneel before Him at the foot of the cross and to follow what He has to say to us from there? And at the tomb when He's risen, and he becomes the first of all of us and to give us new life. Will you hear the wonder of a name that is above every other name? That, my friends, is what we celebrate during this season as Christians. And it is truly the reason for the season. Amen. So I invite you to, to consider what it means to follow, what it means to be able to understand all these things that were happening to, to Mary and to Joseph. And as we sing our hymn of commitment to, to consider it came upon a midnight clear, listen to these words because they match up to the idea of peace, peace that the world has wanted for thousands of years. And to think about what it would mean if we were able to receive that gift of peace. Because he shall be peace, the scripture tells us. Let us stand and sing this morning as we gather together. It came upon the Oh, I'm sorry. 
the days are hastening on by prophets seen of old, when with the ever-circling years shall come the time foretold, when peace shall over all the earth its ancient splendors fling, and the whole world sing back the song which now the angels sing. His name is above all other names. It is Jesus. He has come to save the world, to save us from our sins. Mary and Joseph heard that message, and it has rung down through the years, the same message to us. He has come, and the power of his name itself is to save us and to save our world. May we reach into that and accept and claim that promise for ourselves as we leave this place today. May we share that promise with others around us. Amen. Let's sing verse 7 of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. It's number 211 in together before we leave this morning. Go with peace of Christ this week. Amen. You're dismissed.